Boom, we are live. Welcome to another episode of Alpha Vedic's AlphaCast. We have a great show for you today. We are extremely happy to have a special guest today. Mano Preetri is joining us today. How are you this morning, Mano? I'm great. It's a beautiful morning here in Hawaii. Yes, thanks for getting up so early. We know you're three hours behind, so uh, we appreciate you working with us on our California time here today. Yes, no problem. <laughs> and we also have fellow uh, Alpha Vedic co-founder, Dr. Bear Paul Lando, who you all know, who's on with us today, who has known Mono for uh, a few years, so he's here to join in on the conversation as well. How are you this morning, Bear? I'm doing great. And uh, Mano and I have known each other for more than a few years. We've known each other lifetimes. <laughs> wow, I love it. I love it. We can get into that more. Um, yeah, Mano Preachy, also known as Grace, is a longtime family friend and kindred spirit of Bear, sharing many adventures over the past 30 years. Uh, a native of Neuchatzel, Switzerland, uh, Mano, Early years were fueled by her passion for training horses and innate propensity for questioning the cultural norm, eventuated in world travels with relocation to California, and finally Maui, where she is now. Um, it's, she's been there since about 1990. Uh, it was here that Mano formally commenced her quest within the curriculums of quote-unquote alternative health and the internal martial arts. Uh, she employs Lomi Lomi, Swedish and deep tissue massage, reflexology, shiatsu, polarity, cranial sacral, and hypnotherapy to facilitate her foundational emotional clearing work with the Enneagram, a Sufi science-based method for determining character fixations. That's really what we're going to dive into a lot today. Um, as a trained facilitator in the Kunlun system of energy cultivation, historically used by masters of the martial arts in China's Kunlun Mountains to open chakras, meridians, and energy reservoirs termed Dantians, Mano teaches meditative and breathing techniques to further support people on their path to wellness and freedom. She currently owns and operates an organic farm in Hana on the remote northeast coast of Maui, which is now being prepped as a joint venture with Alpha Vedic Gardens and the production of biodynamically grown Jiao Gulan. Uh, and you can contact Mano through her website, ramanasgrace.org. That's R-A-M-A-N-A-S-G-R-A-C-E.org. Welcome, Mano. So wonderful to have you this morning. And we are excited to dip into uh, a number of topics here. First and foremost, if you want to, you know, I think it would be great if you could introduce yourself to our audience and give us a little background on what led you down this path and how have you ended up on the beautiful island of Maui and what got you into um, working with the Enneagram? Hmm. Okay, so, um, you know, I was, born and raised in Switzerland. And, um, and I had an early, I would say early desire to, for freedom and for enlightenment. That was kind of a driving force um, in my life. I remember reading uh, Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse. And I was fascinated by that book and um, read it many times. And I always felt like that's what my life was about is I want to find enlightenment. I want to you know, be free. So I left Switzerland right after school and uh, went to America because at the time, you know, America was the land of opportunities and freedom and everybody wanted to go there. So I ended up uh, traveling and, and finding my way to California. And, uh, and then eventually from California, I was, you know, a friend of mine brought me to Hawaii, to Maui on vacation and he happened to be friends with Bear. So I actually met Deb and Bear uh, and the kids were young and uh, my, I had, my son was, uh, was young as well. Um, we met in 88 for the first time. And then, uh, and then eventually, you know, it took me a couple of years to move to Maui, but that was clear. It's like, okay, I need to move to Maui. And, um, and then I met my spiritual teacher, Eli Jackson Bear, 
uh, in 99 and uh, I met him here in Maui and um, been studying with him ever since. And he, one of the main tools he uses for, um, you know, for awakening and for seeing through the, the hypnotic trance that we live in uh, mm -hmm. is the Enneagram. So he uses the Enneagram really and the way that I learned it as a tool to to wake up as a tool to see who you're not and to see all the veils of illusion so that we can actually uh, discover our true self. Fascinating. And what is the, um, with, he, with he and you, who, what's the kind of the foundational background behind, um, I guess, the more spiritual side? Um, I know the property is called Ramana's Grace that you have there. And yeah. so... I know, and that's related to Ramana, uh, Ramana, Ramana uh, Maharshi, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, is that kind of uh, where a lot of the spiritual guidance comes from for this for you? Yes, absolutely. So Ramana Maharshi was a very well-known saint in India. He still is. People still go to his ashram by the thousands. And he, um, so the lineage that both that my teacher um, transmits is this uh, transmission of freedom of self. And that came from Ramana. So Ramana, uh, as a young boy at age 16, um, he had a death experience and he let himself die, so to speak, to discover, okay, the body dies, all these things happen but there is a presence that doesn't die. And so he discovered this presence and then the rest of his life was given to diving deeply into, into this and being ever more still. So he went years without speaking and then people kept asking him questions. He started writing a little bit and he, you know, he lived on his holy mountain uh, his whole life and uh, touched many people deeply with his silence. So mostly his teaching was silence, just to be quiet, not to, not to entertain the mind. Yeah, that's uh, traditionally in, in most mystical circles, um, a foundational belief. And while it sounds so simple, is one of the hardest things to do. I practice um, a form of kind of, I guess, Zen meditation, a stillness, um, present, being present, and, you know, a, kind of a classic meditation where you just go to your uh, heartbeat and uh, try to clear everything out of your mind and be completely present. And man, it is not easy to do. <laughs> so um, that's we fantastic. Uh, and so then how how are you currently using the Enneagram? And maybe give us a quick little breakdown uh, into what it is and a bit of the science behind it. Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, again, I learned the Enneagram through Eli Jackson Bear, and he has a different approach to the Enneagram because in general out there, it's being used as a, as a personality, you know, to peg personality types. So mm -hmm. that seems like a little more superficial. Um, but it's actually deeper, uh, the way that he, uh, passes it on. It's more of a vibrational, um, medicine basically. And it actually goes back to the Sufis, but it goes back even further. So, uh, he has tracked it back all the way to Pythagoras, uh, who knew about, you know, mathematics and vibrations and energy medicine, which you know, that's where Bear comes in, right, Bear? I mean, that's where you relate to it on, on a kind of more vibrational level, energetic level. Yeah. Um, that's right. Yeah, and that's, that's really interesting because that's uh, more of a Western philosophical um, tradition with uh, the Pythagoreans, um, you know, the whole know thyself and thou shalt know the universe and God. Uh, it's very fascinating that we've got harking back all the way to there, uh, an East meets West philosophy, if you will. That's right. That's right. And so the Enneagram really is a, is a very brilliant, um, model of, of, uh, it's actually a, um, yeah, it's a mathematical model and, uh, it shows, 
nine different types and those nine different types of it's basically veil veiling of true essence of who you are is being veiled by these um, tendencies which you know combine mental and emotional physical tendencies that um, that run uh, the program so to speak so most of us are um, just uh, in some sort of trance until we actually wake up and realize um, that who we thought we were is not really so. So it's actually really supportive of the awakening. Now, and, I, have yeah. a, I have a question there. Yeah. When it comes to, and I, and I assume we all are in agreement that um, uh, me personally, and I, I assume with the Hindi tradition and such that, um, that reincarnation is in play here. Um, and with the, uh, the concept being that we choose our path when we choose to reincarnate into this reality. We're here for a reason. With the these emotional characteristics, do we choose these while coming in? Um, or is this something that we are kind of forced into due to a number of different um, you know, forces at play? Do you have an idea with that? Or is this getting a little off base? <laughs> No, that's a good question because, um, so according to my teacher, uh, we are born with, like it's in our DNA, our particular uh, Enneagram uh, fixation. And it usually gets activated and kind of crystallized around, you know, somewhere between three and five years old. Usually there's some event that happens during that time that crystallizes it. And then it starts to really become habitual because these are all habitual kind of automatic behavioral patterns that have been there our whole life that we kind of go, well, I've always been like this. I've always had these issues. I've always, you know, felt this way about myself until mm -hmm. you read about it and you go, wow, this really is like a, it's almost like a manual for the human experience, you know? Fascinating. Yeah. Um, let's get into a couple of, so they're saying, and I, and I actually have a wonderful chart here. I'm going to see if I can try to uh, screen share it. It's actually from us that Bear put together uh, the electrophysics of emotion and it relates completely to the Enneagram. So I'm going to try to throw this up in a second here. Um, but it, it, basically it, it's a cool chart because it goes into the geometry of it all. And so essentially they're saying there's nine different character or nine different coordinates, if you will, or character fixations. And each of us fits into one of those. Is that correct? It's correct. In fact, the truth is we have a little bit of all nine. So we, we do, we can relate to each one of those points on some, to some extent, but there's one that is crystallized and that's kind of running the show. Got it. Um, yes, I, I'm, I think I, you know, I haven't really ever done the screen share on, uh, on a live stream like this and I don't know if it's going to mess it up. So I apologize everybody. Uh, I'm going to hold off on that. Um, but what we'll do is we will definitely post this on our telegram channel. In fact, I'll throw this up right now on the telegram and on Facebook and we'll have it up on a resources page on our website uh, because it's a really cool chart and um, essentially uh, taking a little bit from from bears language here the Enneagram illustrates nature's play of electrical forces upon a progressive geometric canvas common to the whole of creation all begins as a point of singularity as depicted in the above diagram so essentially what the diagram showing is a circle and then um, it evolves into a triangle or the law of three, which uh, follows uh, electrical forces, which follow consciousness. And then that develops into a hexag, which represents the flow of energy in its journey through the pressure points of creative spirals. Um, and then it goes into the nine coordinates of the character physics fixations of the Enneagram. And these are areas of compression born from a life lived in the absence of balance. So character fixations um, are, as you were saying, kind of the default behavioral setting that we fall into, which is really fascinating. It's kind of like um, 
our uh, our software that is running our you know and, and I'm, I'm kind of interested in how this relates to our subconscious. Mm-hmm. Um, but what um, you know the function of this, I suppose, is to allow us to navigate through the world in a way that <clears throat> gives us you know for survival, if you will. Um, is that correct? Yeah, it's all based on survival, you know, because it is like a software. It's like this body mind has this program and it's a survival program. So it will, you know, do well. And, uh, and it is a geometric figure of, of nine points, three triangles. And, um, and those, and basically it's, you know, we are like human animals. You know, we're, we're like animals. We have a survival drive, we have a social drive, and we have a sexual drive to reproduce. So those are just like the animals do, you know? And, and then they're um, kind of related to the different emotions. So some of us are more fear-based, some of us are more anger-based, and some of us are more um, needy, needy for love and approval based. <clears throat> and then there is different versions of each one. So those are like the three main points. And then each one has a extroverted and introverted version. So that's how you get the nine. Interesting. So what's the actual technique that you use then to, so let's say I come to you uh, and I'm looking to cleanse a little bit, uh, get a little bit more grounded, if you will. Uh, I'm ready to, have a little bit more spiritual development or whatever and or I'm having some problems in my in my life that I feel like are emotionally driven which typically they always are what would be the process you go through to find out where I stand on the Enneagram and then how do we go about clearing or um, freeing me up from this software design if you will (laughs) <laughs> that's a big question <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so you know to see what are what are the issues in your life what are the emotions that run those issues because there'll be some tendencies we all have all of these emotions negative emotions so to speak but one of the processes is really to no longer be run by those emotions. So to actually discover that you can actually experience emotions without reacting to them, without pushing them down or avoiding them or um, whatever, or indulging in them. There's a, there's a way of kind of directly experiencing emotions, which is a lot more healthy because emotions are just energy. Everything is just energy. Sure. So almost stepping back out a little bit, being more hyper-conscious of, these, of this emotional state and having the ability to not judge and not react, be so animalistic in our reactions, and to have a little bit a higher presence or knowledge of this reality, this physicality that we deal with, because emotions relate to hormones and relate to chemicals in us and um, having the ability then to touch into our higher self, I guess, step back and not be controlled so much by these emotions. I know in my readings on the more, on the Western mystical side um, with like the ascended masters and stuff, this is something that they preach all the time is to control your emotions. It's so crucial in your development as a hyper spiritual being, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. So in relation then to, and, and, and ref, excuse me, I'm still trying to comprehend a little bit how the Enneagram works in regards to actual practice. Do you literally sketch the stuff out or with the geom- geometry or is there any machines you use? How do you, let's say I come to you, how, how would you know, for instance, what number I would be on that scale on, of the nine? So probably by your energy, by your energy and by um, the question you asked, the issues that you're uh, sharing, uh, there is a general sense of what might be running, but it's not that 
black and white because some people that have done, let's say, a lot of work on themselves, it's a, it's a lot harder to see the programming because, you know, sometimes it looks like a six, but maybe it's a different number. Like it, it can be really tricky. So it's not like, you know, it's easy to just say, all right, you know, this is what's running your program. It's more supporting you to discover what are the patterns to see maybe, oh, wow, this pattern's been there my whole life. You know, my, I can look back and see that I've had this issue all along. And then, you know, there's different ways that we can work with it, that we can meet it, that we can see it. And then it's more of a process of you learning about yourself. I mean, it's really all about getting to know yourself. Sure. So it's, it's in a way giving us a little bit more structure and knowledge in terms of what is affecting us emotionally. And then once again, I feel like I keep coming back and this is a common theme amongst most um, spiritual practices, non-judgment, not judging who you are or what you are and understanding that there's no, you know, we all have our issues and that there's actually a substructure to those. And to be able to step back and see that we're all different, but we're also all the same. And there's, you know, there's categories to uh, explain this. That's pretty cool. Um, could you give us a quick little breakdown of some of the different um, nine categories? Yeah, so I think the easiest way to understand it, like I said, is there's three uh, main types that we call the anger types, the fear types and the image um, types is, is one of the ways to call them. And um, so the anger points are, uh, it's more, the fixation is crystallized in the physical body. Hmm. So there's three different types of anger points that are, so the, the, the main anger point is a number nine and the, uh, the internalized anger point that's very perfectionistic would be the one. And the externalized anger point that's pretty outrageous, outlaw, break all the rules would be the eight. And those are, uh, and, and the energetic flavor that runs those points is anger. So they all have anger, a lot of anger in their body, and it's, comes across energetically very pushy interesting so, you know there's there's a flavor of anger that you can feel that's pushy that's strong and potentially scary you know uh -huh. and so that's the anger points so there's three of those and then there's the three emotional points so the where the fixation is more in the emotional body which means they're very identified with the emotions as being who they are. So the emotions is means everything. And there is a tendency of not feeling good enough, of not feeling loved, and of looking for love in different ways. And that's the core um, emotional point is the three. And the internal version is the four. The internalized version is the four, more artistic, more of a melancholy, sad story. Uh, and then the, the two is more outward um, and, you know, I'm going to take care of you and help you and be there for you type of uh, point. And then the three, the three is, is the core uh, emotional point and it's very, usually very successful, very productive, um, you know, uh, in avoidance of emotions. Mm. So that's the emotional points. I mean, this is just a really simple breakdown. And then you got the mental points and uh, that's a different energetic, different vibration, and they are based in fear. So they can see what's going on and they, uh, you know, the, the six is the core fear point. Um, always looking for safety on a deeper level. Um, and, you know, checking all the, all the possible dangers and, you know, being cautious, lots of questions, lots of doubts that are based in fear. 
and there is an internalized point uh, for the fear point, which is the five. And then there's an externalized point that's the seven, like more magical thinking. Oh. So, so these are, um, you know, that's the breakdown between the three different types. And it, it has a vibration. It's vibrational. It's energetic. Um, that's why some of the Enneagram books talk about, well, if your childhood was like this, and if you have a tendency to be like that, you're most likely this point. So like the Enneagram charts you can do online and stuff. But most of those I find are actually miss, you know, they, they don't get to the essence of it, the energetic essence that's really running. So they're more uh, top level, and it sounds like you kind of need a practitioner or somebody who's a little more experienced that can sit with you and really uh, get down to the bottom level of what you truly are. Yes. And what's really running in your life? You know, what are the core issues in your life? And, and you know, to ask some questions to see, you know, what's what's running. Yeah. Bear, yes. Do you have uh, do you have something you want to add to your understanding of the enneagram? Um, yeah, I started doing enneagram a long time ago, probably late seventies. Uh, did more of the conventional approach because that was all that was available. And then over the years, just because my inclination is more into the physics of things, which is going to be a much more boring conversation than listening to you, Mono. But <laughs> but that's where I come from, and the reason why I come from that place is because uh, the physics, when you understand it, really helps us understand there's only essence, as you said, and then we have the ability to qualify that essence in any way we want. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that we're born in with these inclinations on the Enneagram because the physics would suggest that you know, we create asymmetries with, uh, you know, just out of our own ignorance and ig ignorance isn't a bad thing. That's why we play the game is to figure this stuff out. And, um, you know, just like an apple tree that comes up next year after being dormant all winter, when we're in a new incarnation, uh, we're going to carry the same characteristics and the same, uh, you know, positive qualities as well as the asymmetries that we've created in past times. So if somebody comes in and uh, as with a particular character fixation, it's nothing that's been, uh, we're victim of or, or that sort of thing. It's what we came in here on the soul level to do. Um, and, and I'll make this real quick because uh, I get overly nerdy in this kind of thing. But if you take a form of mathematics uh, that would explore more the qualitative aspects of mathematics, which is vortex mathematics. It explains exactly how everything in creation um, occurs and how it occurs from our own consciousness. And when you look at the uh, nine pointed star, uh, you know, made uh, popular in the Western world by Gurdjieff, would, would you say that's true how it came here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, Vortex Mathematics shows the exact formation of that nine-pointed star. So if you, now here's just paraphrasing what Mono said better, but into the physics of it, you would have um, the original triangle that comes from essence, you know, which is just uh, emptiness, because there's, the universe is only pure intelligence and stillness. There's, that's all there is, which you could call light, uh, you know. Um, so when we stir things up with our thoughts, our ideas backed by a desire to manifest, then that creates polarization. Now, when you look at the nine pointed star vortex mathematics, would show how the fulcrum, you know, imagine a pendulum and you have a pendulum swinging back and forth, but it has to have a fulcrum to swing from that would be, you know, perhaps the nine point, um, because nine is like that will force and will force, uh, you know, when it's uh, manifesting in a lower order, we could call it anger of some type, perhaps. Uh, but that's really our will force. And then, we, you know, we have the emotional and the mental side of the pendulum swinging back and forth. So uh, in, in uh, waveform physics, 
you have the first level of manifestation is when thought breaks the silence and creates polarization that creates a vibration so now we have the fulcrum nine we have the three and the six is the the mental and the emotional side swinging back and forth so those are the multiplications of the original idea and or the division forgive me of uh, the stillness and then the wing points, which are the other numbers outside of nine, three, and six, are what multiply uh, the original divisions and then compound those forces into manifestation. And simply put, uh, the way I like to think of the Enneagram, it's like a wagon wheel that's got a little dent in it, one particular spot on the rim. So every time it goes around the bend, you know, it's going to rub on the on the fender every time you hit that point and all of us have a little rubbing point and uh, and it keeps speaking to us until we figure it out so uh my uh you know i'm not a, a, a practitioner of the enneagram per se uh the way mono is specialized in it but what i use it for is to understand emotions as one dimension uh, we even have instruments that measure these dimensions um, that, um, you know, there's, there's only one uh, force that, that creates our entire reality and all the nuances that we put on the dimensions of that spiraling uh, waveform, whatever you want to call it, uh, kind of makes our reality and who we are. And um, so the Enneagram uh, is a wonderful way because emotions tend to get our attention more than anything else and affect our health more than anything else. And so when we understand it that as one dimension of our entirety and, and it, it's inseparable and, you know, like if you're looking at a house from the outside and you've never been inside of it and you're trying to figure out what it looks like, you know, you can look through many windows. And so when you're looking through the nine dimensions of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, say nine different um, windows in the house, you're going to get a little bit of a different angle. And when you're looking through the Enneagram window, you're going to see the same house, but you're going to see it from, you know, that emotional perspective. So uh, with that, I'll, uh, <laughs> any comment you have on that? That's great, Bear. I'm, I'm so glad because, you know, the truth is that, yes, it all comes from one. And, and these are qualities of essence is at the core, you know, the qualities of, of love, of emptiness, of awareness. The, what they call sat, chit, ananda. Um, those are the three points, really. And that's what's being veiled. That's what's being veiled. So who we are is the same. And yes, we have a little bit of each one of these points. And, uh, and yet we separate ourselves. You know, we become this separate entity in our mind of, you know, this is me and, and you're over there. And we, you know, we create this, separation game of some sort and encapsulate ourselves in this uh, idea of who we are uh, based on our upbringing and our conditioning and you know these parents and this upbringing and because of that I'm like this and you know we have a story about who we are so so working with the Enneagram is it's just one of the tools to to actually open it up and to see, wow, but true essence, like you mentioned, stillness, you know, that's where it all came from energetically. And then it manifests and it becomes this web of, um, you know, all these different people out here on the planet. But, you know, I think our path in general is to come home to who we truly are. And that's, you know, that was Ramana's gift really is just stop everything stop looking for anything stop defending or resisting or pretending anything just stop and just be right yeah. here right now in this moment yeah that's always um like we were talking about earlier an amazing thing to do something everybody should try to do every day definitely um so i guess we need to find our enneagram pals that are on the same level with us <laughs> that are where are my fellow ones at um you know no um it's very interesting and i guess you could say modern day psychiatry hasn't helped the situation 
because it's such a top level, very materialistic viewpoint. And you could almost say um, something that is, you know, held back people's ability to evolve and understanding this kind of stuff is so above and beyond uh, any of that uh, kind of Freudian stuff that has dominated uh, people's ability to, you know, help you know, psychological issues where I believe using this could really help mentally ill and people that are having facing more dire issues when it comes to psychosis or multiple personalities, stuff like that. Have, have you had any experience with that? Yes. And so the, you know, the best medicine is, is stillness is stopping is just stopping all the mind activity because in a way including the enneagram it can be a tool that takes us further away from ourselves you know because we take it with the mind and we get fascinated and we want to understand it and we want to get it down versus you you know it's actually a tool to to take away all these beliefs we have about ourselves and to see all these tendencies that we can feel cellularly, we can see, feel these impulses to, you know, react a certain way to a certain stimulus or to, uh, to take a story and make it into, you know, fall into a victim role with it. Or like we all can see these tendencies that we have and this can be a way to come home to yourself to realize, well, what's before all of this? Yeah. Instead of getting more, uh, going out uh, into the world, into the mind, into understanding everything. So actually on some level, another word to, another way to word the, the Enneagram is just, it shows the movements of mind. So if we start from the beginning, there's stillness, you know, there's, there is the essence of love, essence of emptiness, essence of awareness that is our true nature. And from there, we have these different movements and they're energetic movements. And they also happen to relate to the Enneagram. Movements and, and the movements are again, back to our animal drives on some level because you know there's movements, things that we push against, that we fight with, that we don't want. There's things that we're afraid of, that we get away from, that we want to avoid. And then there's things that we want, that we desire, that we feel we need. And those are all, those are the three basic movements. Mm. And we all, you know, the world is, is a big play of all these movements of, mm. of avoidance, of desire, or of some sort of fighting against something. So that's, that's what characterizes, you know, you can see the mess on our planet. It's all a, a big entanglement of all these movements of mind versus just coming home to yourself and to discover what doesn't move and what doesn't change and what is always present in the midst of all the movements. Yeah. And related to that, when it comes to interpersonal relations, finding love, finding partners, et cetera. Would you say that specific numbers relate better to each other or is it very uh, much more kind of, um, uh, I don't know, flexible in, in those terms? It's flexible, but there are certain numbers that tend to attract one another. Hmm. You know? um, but and, and there are actually some of the Enneagram books uh, that are written by some of the other uh, experts on the Enneagram. I think there are even Enneagram books on relationship and the tendencies of people to attract one another. Um, but in the end, you know, it, it really doesn't matter because at the core, we're all the same. Yeah, that's a great message. Um, and how would this relate to... And Bear and I talked about this a little bit um, a couple days ago, but I, I'd love to bring it up to you. Uh, our astrological sign, uh, so me being a Virgo, does that kind of already put me in a certain box on the Enneagram, or does that not relate at all? They're not really related. I think the astrology is just another way to kind of try and understand somebody's 
tendencies or, you know, planetary uh, energetic um, influences. Yeah. 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 So they're not really related. Got it. But you could probably create a sort of matrix of sorts with, with all these different uh, variables for relationships. It seems like they would play a lot into um, how we have inter different interpersonal relationships with others. Yeah. Yeah. And definitely certain types seem to attract one another. For example, the sixes that are fear points will tend to uh, often be attracted to nines that feel very safe, you know, uh, that, that, that because the sixes are looking for safety for something, somebody that's gonna, you know, be really kind of grounded and safe. And the nines will tend to at least initially have that energetics for them. So, you know, there's certain types that attract one another, but again, you know, if there is a deeper desire for truth and for awakening and for freedom and for finding out who you are, um, then it doesn't really matter what point you are or what point your partner is, or it doesn't really matter. Like it, it, we, you wouldn't want to base it on that. Sure. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point too. It's um, in the end, there is no restrictions. That's the beautiful thing. And it's like, there is no, even on the Enneagram, we can, based because this is a consciousness um, related or consciousness derived reality, um, we are, because we're the grand creators, we are never stuck. We are never even in in the original plan here we can change and we can manipulate it just all about awareness yes yes absolutely and and you know they also call the enneagram like a wisdom mirror you know it just shows you so i i find it useful for my own for my own work my own spiritual work like it's helped me get to know myself to see my own tendency to feel to recognize the impulses that I experience at times, you know, for those movements and to be able to actually say, wait, you know, I don't have to give in to these programmed habitual um, behaviors. It's not who I am. I can, I can bear the intensity maybe of a, uh, of an impulse to move and just not move. And then it deepens my, stillness and presence of just being being here being who i am yeah it's as simple as that thing when you're on the the freeway and someone cuts you off with you know a lot of people's first instinct is to react you know i know in the past um that relates probably to me being a number one or nine uh with i think i'm more anger driven in many ways so personally i think i'm probably on that scope of this but my initial reaction is to, you know, give them the finger or something, you know, in my hotter high school days when I was first driving. And I remember having um, a friend's dad who was uh, a boss of mine at the time, who was a very successful businessman. And he said, you know, I remember him telling me this because I would drive him around and like, why do you care? And I'd be like, well, he cut me off, you know, F him, blah, blah, blah. And no, there's no reason to uh, react that way. And he had that ability, even though he was just a very, you know, a businessman, not following Sufi doctrine or anything, but he already had that where he had that stillness. And that is such an important thing to take from any, uh, any uh, spiritual practice is being able to go back to that stillness and uh, control those emotions. And I feel like that is just such a powerful technique and the more uh, ways we can practice that, the better. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, you know, one of the kind of, I don't know if it's easy, but just for imagination, just for maybe experience, is like if for a moment there is no future, if you just say, okay, there's no future, nothing to think about or plan, so we cut off the future and we cut off the past. Yep. And then, you know, so if, if you take that away, because all the mental activity is based on future and past, 
pretty much most of the mental activity runs back and forth between past experience and future experience. But if we take that off, if we cut that off and say, okay, there's no future, no past, what's present right here, right now? What's yeah. Present? And in a way that's bliss, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And if you can engage more in that, um, then essentially, uh, you can be at more at peace and then be happier in many ways. I mean, that's the crux of a lot of what we're, what we're dealing with is just finding that inner peace. Yes. And, and now, you know, the latest thing that I've been um, kind of learning about is our brain and neuroplasticity. And there is really a way that that bliss, you know, like really imagining what, it, what would it be like if you could live your life from that place, from that blissful, open, expanded, peaceful, calm place, which is, you know, where we place our attention and this awareness and a lot of science has now studied, you know, the places that the monks go into with deep meditation and bliss, it's, um, your awareness goes into the frontal cortex, into the front of the brain. And if you keep your awareness there, you can actually keep your attention on that bliss and let that run your life. Instead of, you know, most of us run our lives through our reptile brain and our mammal brain, which is all about survival and, you know, attachment and, and emotional relationships. And we, we live in that world, but oh, there is a way out. Yeah. And there's a way to live in this world, but not be run by all these subconscious programs. You, you mentioned subconscious earlier, because that's what they are. They're, they're subconscious programming until we shine the light on them and we see them and we go, oh, that's not who I am. I don't have to live my life, uh, you know, based on these programs. Sure. Yeah. And that, um, that is such a freeing concept and I something that. that, yeah, it's, um, it's really quite fascinating that um, it's so simple too. And yet we, we tend to want to make everything so much more complex. Um, <laughs> That's true. That's the problem. Yeah. Cause it is very simple. It's not easy because we're so programmed and we have so much in our minds and our world supports this crazy mental activity and, you know, striving for success and for being somebody and whatever. But it's really easy. You can just stop. You don't have to give your energy to that. Yeah. So what are some techniques that you'd recommend to help folks out there who are trying to embrace this more? I know for me, one, one simple thing is breathing and breath and something I've really been trying to develop more and more in my yoga practice. I got into yoga more out of necessity due to um, specific physical pain and stuff that I have from injuries in the past from athletics and just being tall and rigid <laughs> my whole life. But that's the thing that yoga really has been educating me on is understanding how breath works, especially then going into like Wim Hof stuff like that too. And the power of just something as simple as breathing. What are some, Mano, what are some um, uh, techniques that you could offer to our audience that would help them uh, be able to find stillness easier? Hmm. Well, you can ask yourself, like if you, if you notice a particular pattern in your life that's causing you stress, that's causing you unhappiness, some sort of unhappiness, you can ask yourself, what would it be like to no longer have this pattern? What would, be, what, it, what would it be like to be free of that? And, and then that feeling, that opening that happens when you ask yourself that question, you put that energy into the front of your, into your forehead, into the front of your uh, brain, and you just really, the more you can live in that expanded, like all possibilities, you know, not caught by all these things that make you unhappy, but the possibility of happiness, the possibility of freedom and feel that energy, feel what that feels like and put that 
in your frontal lobe and just let it kind of affect your whole body. That would be one kind of quick way to shift yourself out of some sort of negative pattern. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, just such a simple thing as envisioning your reality. I mean, most successful people have vision boards or different things that allow them to interplay between their imagination and reality. And we know hardcore science is showing this now, even that um, the connections between our DNA and um, the informational fields, et cetera, and how with through imagination, we can create these concepts within us. And then if we can connect that to, to belief, to the heart, um, it becomes reality. So that's a extremely valid point there. Yeah. And you know, the key in my experience is you can know and read books and you can have so much knowledge in your mind, but that's not going to give you happiness. So it has to be a deeper experience. It has to be experiential, you know? So then we're talking more about feeling the energy of it or feeling the, the expansion of it, what it feels like in your body and your energy field, maybe emotionally, how it opens your heart, you know, like it, it needs to be deeper than just knowing because just yep. knowing is not enough. Yeah. This is something we talk a lot about on this channel is the fact that the mental plane seems to dominate reality as of now. And you could be the most, the highest intellectual studying all of these philosophical thinkings. If you're not out doing it, you're not out experiencing it, you're not out feeling it, um, there's not going to be any evolution there for you. Yeah. And you know, that makes me think of um, in India, people used to, different other gurus used to tell their disciples, oh, don't go see Ramana Maharshi because he's going to ruin your practice because he was known to just say, you know, what's the point of all your practice if you don't know who's practicing? Find out who's practicing. Find mm. out who has all these questions. So look back instead of look out. So what I see is we're always looking outside ourselves for happiness, for answers, for good feelings, for whatever it is, more success, more money, whatever instead of actually turning our energy back and looking to find out, well, who is it that wants all these things? Yeah. And that's you know, what he was um, known for. And his, who passed, who brought this, you're done. <laughs> who brought this to, um, to the West was Papaji. And, and Papaji used to tell people, go throw all your books in the Ganga. Uh, like everything you've learned, throw it all away and just find out who you are. Yep, yeah, that's about, that's bingo right on there. Um, I'm going to deal with my dog real quick. Bear, uh, do you have anything to throw in here? Yeah. <laughs> sure. I just like to reemphasize that uh, information has nothing to do with, do with knowledge or knowing. Um, feeling is knowing yes. and um, my favorite technique is uh, you know we've surrounded ourselves in nature so uh, mother nature is my shrink uh, all I have to do is uh, go outside and be for a while and take my shoes off or jump in the river and instantly everything shuts off it's also interesting that a lot of indigenous cultures um, didn't have any fast, uh, past or future tense in their language. Mm -hmm. So this isn't a novel idea that, uh, you know, living in present or, or, or that it should be difficult or impossible to live in the present. And when you get into the pure energy side of things, we can explain exactly to satisfy science at this point to how the perception of time past future even occurs in the first place, even though it's not even existing. So we're really living in a fiction when we're not present. It's, it's not happening. Yeah. It literally is not occurring. 
And, um, you know, I, I like to delve into the science part of things, but I very cautious not to get too mental and to use the more the mental plane to uh, integrate certain types of uh, information in a way to reconcile the left and the right side of ourselves because in fact there's enough information that's available these days that would explain again exactly everything Mono's talking about and I think if doctors engineers and and so forth were taught that information <clears throat> which is totally science based then um we would be able to live our lives and model our our technologies and our uh, our scientific endeavors our medicine according to the truth rather than these fictions that keep fortifying the maya or the illusion that mana's talking about and um so we have everything we need to know all we have to do is apply it the enneagram is a wonderful way to introspect and apply it understand more about ourselves and do true evidence-based emotional health care in contrast to the present emotional care that's provided by psychiatry, which uh, where the Enneagram brings you to a point of back, returning to a point of singularity of consciousness, psychiatry leads you down the path of schizophrenia, and <laughs> it really does. And then psychiatric drugs just lock it in and crystallize it so isn't it wonderful that we're now rediscovering that the truth has been under our nose for forever these uh truths have been known by people for tens of thousands of years longer and um that's what originally attracted me to the enneagram and what's nice about the enneagram and when you get into some of the more energetic sides of it you always it's it brings you back uh like everything does to the the triune you know the secret the sacred triune the, the three the magic of the three and you can correlate this to medicine the uh you know the three main points that we talk about in the enneagram you can um correlate them with the three embryological germ cells that create that translate into our biological body as it embryologically unfolds and it would also explain to us how all the things that we think of as disease unfold by way of those forces that we're talking about in the enneagram translated through biology and so understanding the enneagram i believe is the best starting point to and i don't want to say cure disease because disease doesn't really exist the way we think it does either it's just part of the the manifestation the fiction so the enneagram is not just a cute little uh new agey kind of thing uh, or touchy feel it's 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 the real thing yeah yeah, and you made a good point earlier about nature and finding, uh, you know, your peace and presence by going into nature because nature is truth. You know, that is the the natural uh, forms uh, in its, you know, of the simulation in its most pure form because it's not being blocked or uh, uh, manipulated by a consciousness like that we have where we can <clears throat> do do to things like the any what the enneagram shows is and these pre-pattern soft software where we continually over manipulate and, and com cause complexity where nature is just is you know it just is so going back to nature and i think us three we kind of 
are living the talk a little bit. Bear and I live pretty remote, and you've been up here, Mono, and see where we live in a fairly remote area um, with not much population, completely surrounded by national forests and rivers and uh, and nature, as well as you uh, in Maui there, uh, back in uh, Hana, which I've driven through, not your property specifically, but I've done the road to Hana a few times and it's absolutely amazing and I can't wait to visit your property, but you're doing it as well. And I think this is a good segue to kind of just jump, <clears throat> jump into what you're currently doing with the land and how we're interfacing with that. And so how's that going there? And if anybody is interested in knowing more about uh, Mono's space, you can go to Ramana's Grace or Ramana's Grace org, and that is a great overview of currently her operation there in Hana. Yeah. So yeah, thank you, Bear, for bringing nature because that's definitely I feel like that's my church in a way. You know, like just go outside and and yeah put your feet on the ground if you can uh, uh, be barefoot um, feel the earth and connect because we are nature we're part of nature and we're you know the the five elements the elements are part of us you know we are walking on this earth and we you know we're part of heaven and earth and nature and the elements and all of that is a very nourishing thing and I think for a lot of people that's their that's what helps them go take a walk or hug a tree or you know just be outside and get out of the artificial world that we've created um that that already definitely helps and um you know I was um guided to this land um I wasn't like looking at the real estate and and you know comparing properties or anything. I, um, I woke up one morning, I was at a spiritual retreat with my teachers in Hana, and I woke up one morning and this voice said, call, call this realtor and see if there's land here in Hana. That wow. You. And I followed up on that and uh, that day, and um, sure enough, this property had just come on the market and there were the, you know, the price was lowered and, and, you know, everything just lined up. So I was guided there. I saw the land. There was an immediate, yes, there was an immediate also kind of vision of a much greater center there, not just, you know, a, a land for me. And, um, and then, every, you know, somehow just all the details were, uh, were right and fell into place. And two months later, I had this land and, you know, I, I didn't do it. <laughs> I feel like I was guided there. And so I felt like it was Ramana, who is my guru, if you will. He's, he's really, um, you know, his teachings has, has been life changing for me. And so, you know, it was natural to, to call it Ramana's grace because he guided me there. That's at least that's how I feel. And, um, and to create a center that is dedicated to this awakening, this stillness, the discovery of who you are, which brings about a natural sense of happiness. You know, when you, when you live in that present moment, when everything stops, when the mind stops, the future and the past stops, and you're just here and present, there is, there's happiness, there is openness, there's freedom, there is peace. Um, so that's what, you know, that, that was the founding principle of this property and then to create a farm, uh, and to feed the people. And especially here in Maui, we're very aware that, you know, we don't have a whole lot of food on our island to feed the people. If someday the boats don't come or the planes mm. don't come with all the supplies. So there's a very strong movement right now for regenerative agriculture for more farming, you know, to, for planting more food, uh, you know, because the Hawaiians, you know, had it all figured out and they 
uh, just like Bear was mentioning, the indigenous cultures, they knew how to work with the land, how to take care of it, not to own it, but to care for it and to grow things and to connect with, you know, what parts of your land, what kind of plants would do best there and to listen to the land. And that's kind of how I've approached it is just really to be in harmony with the property, to, to spend time there and be quiet and meditate and get insights as to, yeah. oh, we could do this over here. We could do that over here, how to develop it because it was uh, raw land, you know, it was just jungle that I um, purchased. So we've slowly been developing it and, uh, you know, letting it show itself and show us. Um, and then of course there was a blessing of the land. Uh, I found, you know, through friends, I found uh, uh, somebody in Hana that whose lineage uh, has a connection with that particular part of Hana. And uh, she came and did a, you know, a blessing ceremony and um, just to connect with the ancestors because the spirits are very strong. Sure. Uh, uh, and, it, you know, just to keep everything harmonious. And so it, it just feels really beautiful. And, and I'm excited to, you know, to start growing some of the tropicals for Alphabetic and, um, and just to connect with you guys in that way. That's very exciting. Very cool. And shows your wisdom with um, taking your time with the land, just being on it for a while so that you can listen to it. Um, I'm going deeper and deeper into permaculture of late. It's become my new fascination. Um, been geeking out on videos. I was up till way too late last night watching some amazing videos of people that are in the middle of the desert, you know, redeveloping spaces and using what the, even the desert's giving and having vibrant gardens and um, even with with ten inches of water a year. You know, Hawaii is a veritable Garden of Eden, if you will. So the ability to use permaculture and biodynamic farming there uh, is very exciting for us because we know just how lush and amazing it, it is. And we can't wait to interface more and, and have um, some massive success there on your land growing amazing stuff. Yeah. And everything grows very fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, wonderful. I can't wait to come out and visit. Definitely um, never going to complain about having to go out to Maui. So <laughs> one of our favorite places. And um, yeah, thanks so much for being a guest today. Bear, any parting words for our audience or our guest? Uh, no, I mean, I could, uh, Mon and I will probably chat a little bit later, but uh, it's always great to catch up. So, Mana, have you been uh, to our hidden beach uh, in a while? Remember the first time you introduced Deb and I there? At, at, uh, mm -hmm. Nice. So are our dolphin friends still there? Uh -huh. Oh, the hidden beach. Okay. Yes, the dolphins come through. Uh, they do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if so, they come through um, every day, but yeah. Okay. So the first time you took us here, where it's on the road to Hana, and, and you have to know where you're going, and, and we weren't aware of this place. And so Mana took us through the jungle and you get to a little hidden bay and then you swim way out. And when you're out there, it's, it's amazing because uh, the ocean all of a sudden just drops off and it's like you're suspended in space and you can see down for, I don't know how long. I mean, it's really a trip. And then so Mana said, okay, just wait. Uh, we'll be surrounded by dolphins in a few minutes. And, you know, there's nothing when we swam out. We were there for a little while, and then all of a sudden you see one, and, and then pretty soon we're just surrounded on all sides. It was pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you have that experience every time you go there, or was that just a good day or what? Um, and yes, and I don't go there that often. And, um, you know, f things change a little bit. You know, certain mm -hmm. paths have been uh, uh, made uh, private property and and no longer accessible things like that but um i remember being there a few times and having uh experiences with the dolphins there mm -hmm. yeah yeah so mana just before we uh, leave here here's uh what our leaves look like this year uh-huh that's, that's not cannabis everybody even though they look kind of similar 
Wow. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. So, uh, extremely healthy this year and tasty. Mm. Yeah, we're already harvesting. Uh, this is what they look like after they're dry. So, Mana is going to be uh, doing this on her property and enabling us to produce a lot more and, and hopefully year round there, whereas we're more seasonal here. But here's wow. uh, what they look like. Okay. And uh, okay, it just dropped all over my keyboard there. Yeah, we'll go but um, looks much, much different than what you buy overseas. Let's just say that. And it has a wonderful smell and uh, just nice, big, plump, hand picked leaves. That's so cool. we're really excited. And uh, with uh, Sister yeah. Farm in Hawaii, it'll also give us uh, an excuse to return to Hawaii much more often because we, you know, it's home to us and we raised our kids there and we miss it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and definitely my, my kids are excited about our collaboration and, uh, you know, cause you guys are family. I mean, we all, our kids know each other. We all hung out together. We lived together a few times, you know, uh, yeah, we did. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was remembering when we lived together in Kipohulu. That was an amazing property. We had 12 acres. Yeah. And it was uh it was a plantation. We had every kind of fruit you can imagine growing there. You could just walk down the road and take your showers at the end of every day in a in a waterfall with a pool and it was surrounded by ginger which you use for soap and uh it was a pretty nice lifestyle. And you could, uh, I'll, I'll uh, hazard saying this, you could hear the old ones. And, you know, when you're in the islands and you get in the back country, um, the old Hawaiian magic is alive and well, and it's not imaginary. So, uh, <laughs> again, I hesitate to say this, but you hear the voices and and, uh, you know, it's the veils are thinner there uh, when you go to certain areas. We'll just say that. Yeah. And so these uh, places that were right on our property were just uh, magical, to say the least. And we we're blessed to all live there together. We had multiple uh, dwellings. We had people coming in from afar for health care. And uh, it was a great time. It was. Well, I would love to redevelop something like that so that I can spend some winters there. <laughs> or spend right, that's when everybody wants to come. And you guys definitely gets cold and, and snowy where you are now, right? Well, we get, a, yeah, we get dustings, but it's only going to get worse um, because of the grand solar minimum that's on its way. That's already started. So the next 15, 20 years is just going to get colder and colder and harder to grow. So um, having more temperate locales to as backups for growing and places to go to get some relief is super important. So Hawaii is um, number one on my list for second home, or I, I'm liking more and more the idea of just getting some land. Maybe it's just through Alpha Vedic in partnership with you and developing more of a permaculture community on it where we have multiple smaller um, homes that are built into uh, in there in a very naturalistic way where we're collecting water and in off totally off grid and having like a community outdoor kitchen uh, community outdoor showers etc and just having a very naturalistic way a uh, uh, means of living yeah and that's that exactly will be a, that will be another whole discussion about the uh, climate change but not the the type that we're hearing about on the media this is actually taking us in the other direction so people need to know more about it and uh, know that the the temperatures are going to be greatly declining it's going to affect food production um, just the other day we cited a woolly mammoth up here in Big Flat <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, guys, great, great chatting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. That was awesome. Yeah, and we'll, we would love to have you on again down the line as your operation begins to flourish more and uh, to get updates on everything. Mano, so thanks again for joining us today. Once again, everybody, uh, if you are interested in finding out more about uh, Mano and her um, 
her property and everything she's doing on there. And will you be eventually having retreats there and doing different functions there as well, I assume? Well, that was, that's the plan is to create kind of an eco retreat center like you were talking about, you know, little uh, bedrooms, little pods, little cabins where a few people can stay and then a communal kitchen, outdoor, everything's outdoor, you know, and with harmony with the land because you don't need big houses you know you you're outside most of the time and that's what i love uh being here in hawaii is it's a very outside life you don't spend a whole lot of time in the house you know so the house doesn't have to be big it's better to actually have the gardens and have you know outside places to be sure oh yes some you know some trainings some um, to host certain teachers and certain trainings and uh, as well as personal retreats. So if somebody just wants to get away and maybe do a cleanse or do a silent retreat or, uh, you know, kind of cater uh, some sort of uh, retreat, um, just personalized, that's another thing that I'm uh, looking at offering. Very cool. Well, I'm going to take you up on that for sure. And uh, once again, her website is ramanasgrace.org, R-A-M-A-N-A-S-G-R-A-C-E.org. We'll put it in the description below for the video and the podcast. And please go visit the website and uh, her contact info is on there. If you liked the show today, please subscribe to us. We are streaming on DLive. That's dlive.tv. You can subscribe there and get notifications on when we're live next. Typically, it's every Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. We're having more and more guests on, and we'll be covering a ton of fun topics, as always. Uh, We also do a live replay on YouTube on Thursdays at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, where we premiere it there. Oftentimes, we're on the live chat as well. So if you miss the live stream and have questions for Dr. Bear or myself or potential guests, we'll be there to answer those as well. And that's on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to that if you prefer YouTube and hit the notification bell to, to find out when we are going live there or having new videos there. And finally, our Telegram channel is our best place to interact with us on the daily. That is t.me forward slash Alpha Vedic. Of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those others. But Telegram is really something we've engaged the most in. And that's an easy app you can throw right on your phone, on your smartphone or on your computer and engage with us. It's completely free, of course. And that's Telegram. That's t.me forward slash Alpha Vedic. Thanks again, guys, so much. Uh, for joining us today and have a wonderful day. Blessings to all.